Tell me, are you ready to find your weird way? Weird was a concept that was spoken of long ago. It meant fate. It meant destiny. It meant your path in life. I'm your host, Dean Bentley, and I am here to explore how you can connect to your own path in life, to know the essence of your own soul, to connect to that single spark that lives within the deepest recesses of your being that says this is why I am here to go beyond the limitations, the constrictions of the modern world and open you to the possibilities and the potentiality of what is possible within this world. Join me as we dive deep on The Weird Way. Welcome back. We have another episode of The Weird Way here. I'm sitting beside my brother, Jason Blewett, and he is the director and creator of the Primal Man Project. And I'm looking forward to this conversation, man. Nice, bro. Good to be here. Thank you, man. One of the reasons I feel like I'm excited to have this conversation is I know both of us have had a lot of interest in the men's work space, masculinity, and helping men connect back to their masculinity as a whole. And I know for myself, this has been such a journey of rediscovering what it means to be a man in a healthy expression and learning, oh, I can express this part of myself and know how to integrate that within society. So I'm wondering if we can just dive in and like you share a bit about like your own journey of what led you to this path of wanting to both lead men, but also reconnect into your own masculinity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Depends on how far we want to go back in the story, go back right to the beginning. Um, so I was born and raised in Papua New Guinea. So I, I, had, I had some really cool early experiences that I didn't realise at the time were probably planting seeds. Um, you know, grew up around um, men and boys being initiated. And we would go on like, go on picnics to, you know, creeks and things. And, and I get told as a kid, you know, don't go down to that creek. That's a women's creek. I'm like, what? What are you talking about the women's creek? <laughs> you know, women don't own the creek. It's a creek. It's a creek. And I said, no, no, trust me. It's, it's a sacred women's business down there. It's just better this way. Just don't go there. I was like, okay, right. So that sort of planted a seed and, you know, we'd be driving around in different times and you'd see these interesting rituals and ceremonies going on and, and that hut down the beach, that's a man's hut. I'm like, what do you mean a man's hut? Oh, well, the, the cats and the dogs and the chickens and, and the boys, they're all male. It's just a, it's a male space. It's sacred and they do secret men's business. It's like, well, what do they do? It's like, well, it's fucking sick, secret again. And and so there were these, yeah, interesting experiences that yeah, I didn't realize later would sort of come full circle. And um, you know, let, grew up in that amazing environment in PNG, right? Learned so much without realizing I was learning it. And then fast forward, I came to Australia, did the boarding school thing. So the complete polar opposite, mm-hmm. hyper. To- I don't like the word toxic masculine, but if it was a word that was used probably a good place to talk about it it was racist chauvinist sexist all the ists <laughs> fucking all boys catholic boarding school uh, hostile environment and yeah masculinity was at its most distorted in that environment so i had this fish out of water experience and it was um yeah it was a real a real contrast experience i didn't feel comfortable with men i thought men were cunts i thought they were fucking just mean nasty people that wanted to get off on hurting people because that was what that that environment fostered you know that dominance of, of boys over other boys there were no good masculine men to initiate those boys it was boys initiating themselves so followed the dutiful path of career and went and studied in uni and got married young and, and kind of went down the I suppose the, the typical you know corporate path went and got a job got married got had the wife and kids and yeah, just had a, a really challenging time with, with my wife's mental health. She attempted suicide a few times. My marriage broke down and I just went down the gurgler because everything in my life was created around following this career path, doing the thing that I was supposed to do. And it was just when the card house of cards of the bullshit world that I'd created for myself came tumbling down, it was like there was nothing underneath it. There was nothing... There was no tribe, there was no connection, there was no self-responsibility, I didn't have masculine role models. And so I just took a very destructive path to feeling good and comfortable about myself. Lots of dating, lots of women, 
lots of sex and yeah it became a sex addiction uh you know issue for me and eventually somebody said to me you know, a couple of different people said hey what, what you're doing is not working you know how are you doing how are you doing life just you need, you need to go and do some work on yourself so i went along to my first men's work event back in 2018 and that was the moment that kind of felt like it put the puzzle piece in that had been missing it sort of felt like it came full circle and i had good strong masculine men who gave a fuck about what i'd experienced who called me out on what i was doing um called me forward into you know a, a more integral version of myself and yeah for me it was like holy shit okay this is this is what it, this is what we're supposed to have we're mm -hmm. supposed to have an initiatory process you know in 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 a man's life there's supposed to be a tribe to to belong to there's supposed to be this feeling of sacredness about our life and about who we are as men. And I was like, man, this is it. This is the piece that was missing for me, but also for everybody else. That's probably the two minute summary story mm. version. Mm. I, I love this so much. And a big thing I'm passionate about is like the seeds that are planted along the way. Yeah. And like, I can see that so clearly. And it sounds like you see that as well of like that experience in Papua New Guinea, where you had this experience of like what it means to be around men who are initiating other men who are connected to like, this is masculine, this is feminine and being guided through that. And then the disconnect that occurred that bred something completely different and actually returning to that. And, and I'm curious, like when you're looking back at that now, like, does it feel like that all needed to happen to bring you here? Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Didn't, didn't know the purpose of it, but it can see it really clearly connecting the dots looking back. But it was, um, I was a fish out of water everywhere because I was a white kid in a black country. And so I was never initiated in that environment. I never, I never got to belong into those processes. And when I was in Australia, I was a fish out of water because I was a white kid who probably acted more like a black kid in a very white country. Mm. And so everywhere I was, I was an outsider. And so what I really craved was belonging. And once I found that belonging, you know, strangers that gave more fucks about me than my own family, mm. you know, in terms of being able to have those conversations. And I, I don't want to hang any shade on my family, but just gave the things to me that I needed that I had never been provided. And, th and that sense of belonging was, again, you know, something I always missed. And now, you know, I create belonging for men. You know, the work I do now is about creating tribe for the modern man. Mm. And, and what changed for you in the moments where you had these men come in and were able to, like, provide that for you? I remember there was this moment where, you know, I'd been through a really big process, like a trauma reenactment. So I reenacted, you know, uh, situation from my early life and confronted this man who was playing the role of my father and it got really heated and and then by the end I was just a sobbing mess you know I just and and we reconciled in this reenactment and the man was holding me and then the 40 50 odd men in the room big room of, of guys in this process they were all wrapped around in this massive group hug and it was I was sobbing my eyes out into the arms of a man I'd never met who was holding me in a way that was genuine caring authentic it was there for my healing it was there in service to me and i remember i kind of it was like a thunderclap of like i made a deal with god creator universe whatever word you know resonates i, I just made a deal i was like okay everybody needs this mm -hmm. um so you know that was the moment that sort of set me off down the path and yeah it's it's something that i've made my life's work and focus ever since Mm -hmm. I, I love that it reminds me very much of one of my first experiences in, in a group of men I sat in a men's circle years ago now and at the time I was depressed I was anxious and it was the first time I shared with men that I wanted to kill myself oh, wow. and it was like fuck to be held in that mm -hmm. in a space of love and being like our pain is welcome yep. that changes things when we actually have that experience where all the emotion all the pain all the things that we feel like we can't share as men it's being able to be held space for and just like hey man this is okay you yep. get this it changes our life yeah yeah mm. yeah and and so for you that was a pivotal point where you realized hey i'm here to serve at that point i hadn't yet decided that it was my job to give it to everybody i just knew that i wanted to be a part of it and i knew that 
it was like this awareness that it, there was a piece missing. And, you know, I, I got the bug. Uh, you know, I went, I went back to their sequel events and went through their full curriculum and, you know, shout out to and massive credit to Real Education for the Real Man work that they Real, – Real Man was the program I went through and so much respect and love for, for Murray, my teacher there, and everything that he provided. And, yeah, it was just my experience of doing their work and which led into – uh, volunteering on their workshops and being you know, on crew there and mm-hmm. you know after a little while I just it started to dawn on me that I had some skills I had a passion um, I'd come from a career of communicating I'd come from a career of facilitating change I came from you know an industry where um, helping people go from where they are to where they want to be was part of the skill set I developed and yeah, the, there was so much crossover, so much – there was such a good fit yeah. and it just happened and, and evolved really naturally. When I look back now, I, I was – yeah, I was pretty obsessed. <laughs> I fucking spent every dollar I had, every waking moment, listening to books, podcasts, yeah. going to workshops, seminars, retreats, or just men's work, personal development, psychology just became a fucking healthy – obsession yeah i feel like most people on this path have had that stage where it's like <laughs> this is my world and this is yeah. all i'm about i know i've had that yeah, period where yeah. it's like all my money's going towards it oh, and so. and like when you're sharing i'm like this is the initiation experience into this work and and to be willing to have that experience you know where we are supporting others who are leaders and actually being able to hold that space not as the leader per se, but actually as someone who's supporting that, it's such a part of the initiatory experience. Yeah, hundred percent. And what I realized now is I was going through my my apprenticeship, you know, um, looking back, and I remember there was a moment where I really decided to sort of take things uh, on, um, take take it on myself. Was you know after probably the first workshop, I got out of this experience. It's like a Sunday night. I've had this life changing weekend. It's been like sacred and profound and fucking awesome i've had more fun in three days than i have ever in my life it was the most amazing three days of my life changed the trajectory I, you know, if, you, if i had to put a single event that, that changed my life the most that would be it but i came out of this experience it was on the sunday and i'm like okay cool tribe sacred fuck yes initiation you know where cool where to from here and they go come back in six months for the sequel workshop and i was like what what uh and join the facebook group <laughs> and i look in the facebook group and it was a couple of ladies that would post memes you know and i'm like no disparagement to these guys love their work that's what they did at that time mm-hmm. but i was like no nah, fuck that i i need more <laughs> so uh, literally a month after my first workshop uh, i had the audacity to run my first men's circle And that was the word that they used to describe what I was doing. This guy, this fucking guy, yeah, audacity. And then it was just, it was, I wasn't teaching anything. It was just, I've got a fire. I want to see you men. So I just invited all the bros that I met through the Mm -hmm. community and just said, hey, I'm hosting a circle. And I just passed a piece of paper around with a couple of words on there and just said, hey, reflect on what these things mean to you. So I ran my first men's circle as a fucking greenhorn right out of the fucking back of my first men's work event. So, yeah, and that just kind of started the journey that I realised that if it wasn't there, I needed to create it. Mm. I, I love this piece. Like I'm a big believer in the mythic and I love like the mythopoetic movement of actually viewing a lot of these things through myth. And it's like in that moment you decided to – in a sense, leave the tribe or start your own tribe. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering about that internal experience where you've gone from being like a member of the tribe to actually becoming a leader who's willing to stand for something more yeah. and, and that experience there to actually see. Because a lot of people have that experience where it's like, cool, I'm in the tribe and then it's like, what's next? Where can I go from here? And they can feel a little bit contracted of like, I, I don't have the capacity to go stand out or yeah. like, leave the tribe and this is such an important part to step into our own masculinity so in that experience like what changed for you in them moments it it wasn't always smooth sailing so Mm. when i founded primal man project and i you know i can tell you the story about how that happened but when i did found it there were individuals who were part of the community that i was a part of that that were in opposition you know that essentially told me i needed to complete certain amounts of training or i needed to get permission and 
I want to be clear that that's not the position of the, the facilitator. That's not the position of the teacher. Him and I are on great terms and, you know, he's supportive of what I do. But humans are human. So someone leaves a tribe to create their own. There was a bit of resistance there. And it was actually perfect because that resistance actually provided me the fuel that I needed. You know, those, those individual conversations were like, okay, fa- fantastic. I can't do this. Great. Fucking watch me. And I know that's a little bit impetuous, a little bit of a little boy kind of defiance energy. But at that time where I was, that was, that was great. That was fuel for the fire. And for a couple of years, I made sure that what I did didn't contradict or compete with the tribe that I was still a part of. It was still a big part of my life. So I offered a one-day retreat that was outdoors when they, they were offering you know, multi-day events. I would offer online men's circle and an in-person men's circle they weren't offering men's circle yep. so i wanted to be complementary not competitive to the tribe and it's really only been in the last probably two to three years where i've completely left the nest and, and no longer you know volunteer at their workshops but still on great terms and we still have mm-hmm. so much love and respect for each other very different things we do but yeah it's um still got lots of love for, mm-hmm. the home, for, for the for the og tribe mm-hmm. and it's such a beautiful thing and uh, like even this you know, I think of it as a young bull who's like, I'm raring to go. I've got all this energy. Like, can't sure. that us as young men or yeah. like just when we get that fire, we can be a little bit immature and all of that. And it, like, it's also a little bit necessary. There's got to be some conflict with, yeah. you know, with, 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 the, with the dad, right? This is part of the initiatory journey for, for young boys. And I mm. think often mothers get the brunt of this, you know, this, this phase of like the testosterone boost around that 12, you know, 11, 12, 13 and, and traditionally, that's when initiation would happen, right? The boys would be taken out from the care of the mother and sent off into the bush or into their initiatory journey and then they would, they'd would be brought into their own masculinity and say, all right, you're no longer a, tr- a child, we now expect this standard of you. And that energetically was what happened. You know, mm-hmm. there, was enough, there was enough of that sense of, okay, you know, energetically butting heads or energetically feeling like I needed to leave the nest – uh, yeah, it was perfect. It was. It happened as it was supposed to. But yeah, so much love for those guys. Mm. And I don't take it as a coincidence. As what are you you're creating right now is called the forge, and yes. it's like you know that steel sharpens steel. It's 100%. needed. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's really exciting. So we're we're almost five years in. So mm. you know, four and a half years of of primal man project. So I founded in twenty twenty, mm. and we ran. I ran three men's circles every week for probably three, three and a half years. Um, you know, last count was probably a couple of hundred men's circles and we ran them all for free. Mm. And, and that was a big part of what I felt like was my rite of passage into facilitation and holding space and circle for men. And yeah, it's also part of what I wanted to give back. And, you know, it came a point where it really needed to, it really needed to be a thing that people were invested in. And when I was giving this away for free, it wasn't, men weren't putting skin in the game so we, you know we we've been working in the last six months to create um a community a container in an online platform called the forge mm-hmm. and we launched uh two weeks ago and we've got you know 33 men in there right now which is a really cool number mm-hmm. and yeah it's it's a low ticket investment but it's enough to have skin in the game mm-hmm. and those guys are showing up every week and it's fucking awesome to have a zoom screen just full of faces from all over the country um so yeah it feels feels like a great evolution Mm, I, I love this and I'd, I'd love if you can speak more into this concept of actually putting skin in the game yeah. Be, because as like I, I've done this the same when I started my coaching I was doing a lot of free offerings yeah. and it's like cool I was getting me experience which was great and I was learning and building confidence and all of this and there was an aspect where the people I was coaching weren't fully invested because it's like well I'm not valuing it. I was because I was getting a lot from it of skills of developing my own ability yeah. and they didn't have the skin in the game so they can only get so much results. But when we invest with, there's an element of care and it doesn't mean it needs to be a lot. It needs to be something, but this willingness to actually put our skin on the line and be like, I'm in. And what you've seen when men are willing to do that and when it's like this half commitment of like, yeah, I'll show up because you know, why not? Mm-hmm. And the difference between the two. I've wrestled with this for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I had a business coach I worked with a couple of years ago, uh, Jess Clare, an absolute le- legend, and she said to me, what are you doing giving away men's circles for free? She was coaching me in my business, so she said, look, charge for these things. And I had this, maybe it was a nice guy thing of wanting to give, 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 so I could feel worthy and enough. 
Maybe it was a genuine altruistic intent, probably a little bit of both. But what I've learned, and I've given away a lot, like I gave away, I've I've made a practice of giving away spots on my, you know, three-day retreat, which I've been running now for a couple of years, but it's three and a half thousand dollars and I've and I've sponsored, you know, so Primal Man Project pays the costs for that man to come and attend. And it's yeah, I've, I've done again that because I believe that men shouldn't miss out on the opportunity to do the work if he's enrolled, if he's committed, if he's the right man and yeah. he's going to receive. And the actual show up rates for those men in our post retreat programs and containers and events. It's just I continue to get shown and humbled the same lesson over and over and over again that a person will only be as enrolled as they've had to expend effort, time, energy and, and money to, to be there. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're not doing that anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's a big experience I've had and my experience is I'm more willing than they are yep. and that's the rescuer dynamic and I've caught myself sure. in it where it's like, oh, I, wanna, I want this man to evolve. I want this person <laughs> to get the results and get like his shit together and be able to go beyond this. And show up, motherfucker, <laughs> show up. Yeah. I'm fucking here. I'm fucking right. Yeah. And like there's been my own wound and in that where it's like, you know, I you know, I want I want you to get something out of this, but it's also like that deep desire for a man to realize his own potential. Yep. And it's fucking beautiful when they can do that, but there's actually this humbleness to take a step back and be like, "Cool, I believe in you, but you've got to take that step." For me, it comes down to the worth that I try and get from the results I want for him that he doesn't want as much as I do. Yeah. That that sense of if I can get this man this breakthrough, I'm enough. Yeah. You know, and and that detachment is yeah still something I'm working on. I'll, I'll have guys invest like my twelve month programs, you know, ten grand, and they receive a retreat at twelve, uh, you know, a deep online container, and then a, an ongoing mastermind. And I'll have guys go through the experience, get initiated, become to part of our tribe, go through the deep work, you know, a course that I run um, around purpose, and then just flail out the back end, you know. And I'm, and I'm like, I'm making it about me. Like, what have I not done? What have I not provided? What do I need to do differently? You know, full responsibility. But again, that comes from this wounded place of feeling like I'm going to be abandoned. Yeah. You know, that that's really like that feeling of like they've left me. Yeah. And if they've left me, I'm not enough. And it's like, fuck, I can I can take it horse to water. You know, it's such a cliche, but yeah, I think it applies here. Yeah, and such a humbleness as a facilitator to step away and trust a person's journey of like yeah. I, I trust in this is what's best for you. Even if I'm like, I know there's another path for you here. You get, get on the fucking boat and come with me. I know you, there's a way through here. And they're like, no, I don't want to do this. And yeah. it's like, can, can we honor them enough? And yeah, also, no, no, I'm going to throw stones on the way out. Fuck you and your fucking projections and you're fucking wounded and you're fucking this way. And I know better than you and all that. And I'm, I'm in my ego and fuck you. And, yeah. It's not me, it's you and yeah, oh yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It, it's this constant reminder that we need to be doing the work ourselves. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, we don't need to do the work. We just, no. Right. <laughs> We're perfect. Yeah. Um, we've got the podcast I'm, mics. We are perfect. Correct. Yeah. I'm, I'm standing at the front, therefore I've got it all figured <laughs> No. Yeah, I, I feel like this is a great segue because I, I feel like this is a change in model of leadership that I, I'm loving is mm -hmm. where like, as leaders, we're allowed to fuck up. We're allowed to get it wrong. And, and this for me has been like where I've felt like an imposter and actually just started owning my shit. Hey, I feel like I fucked up. I like, can just yeah. allowing myself to be seen in that has uh, given me such permission to be a leader without having an all right. And, and this is like, I don't know, for me, the idea that as a leader, I need to be perfect kills me. Yep. I, I've fucked up, I've hurt people, I've messed around in my business and haven't got people the results I want. I've done a lot of great work, I can own that. But like for me, this humbleness of being like, hey, we get to be ourselves, we get to be human. Mm. And, and like, have you seen this in your own journey of like the willingness to be human and like... Fuck. Every day, bro. Yeah. Every day. I've got a, I've got a rabid perfectionist that hangs out. He lives, yeah. he lives rent free just, <laughs> and he's, um, he, he is the voice I hear the loudest when I feel like I'm not living up to my own expectations. So, you know, growing up as a kid, uh, I remember I have this really specific memory, like driving along in the, in the car, probably might've been like six or seven years old and, my dad 
super smart guy, very successful, very driven, you know, set a very high bar for himself and for, for you know, all of, all of us. I'd fight, I was one of five. And um, he asked me a question and I got the answer wrong. Mm. And bless him, having a hard day, whatever was going on for him, you know, I've got so much compassion and actually gratitude for what this created. But he looked at me and he just said, you're thick. You're thick. And... Um, yeah, just in that moment, I made I made the decision that it wasn't okay to get the answer wrong, mm. and I've you know for me that created a value. I have a value of excellence, yeah. and and the shadow of that value of excellence is perfectionism, and yeah. So getting it wrong and being willing to get it wrong is still a process that I you know I'm working on every day. Yeah. Um, but what what what's really confirming evidence of it's a good strategy of being vulnerable and authentic is that one of the pieces of feedback that I f- have felt most appreciative of from my work is that men come up and say, Hey, you don't feel like a guy that's standing up the front proclaiming to have it all figured out. You seem to talk a lot about your fuck ups and you feel very relatable when you do that. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty core part of what I do and what I share is that I'm here to share the ways that I fucked up and the things that I learned from that. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a different way of leadership because it's like, Hey guys, this is me. Yeah. And it like, for me, there's been such a illusion that you need to be perfect to be a leader Mm -hmm. and you need to be the guru, someone up on stage, having it all perfect. And it's like, that's not the way to healing. If I'm going to follow a man, I want to know his imperfections and what he's struggled with. So I can, accept them within myself 100 percent, and that's the man i'm gonna back and that's the man i want to be for others of like no I've, I've messed up yeah i'm okay with that i'm learning to love myself in that and i'll continue down that path of like it's okay to be me so yeah. they can be okay to be them what one of the things that for me like when i think about being out in front of people or being in a platform where i'm sharing ideas representing this is valuable information is that the fear of judgment you know, is, is there and what I've tried to do, not always well, perfectly, but if I get out in front and share all the things that I've been and I've done in my life, what are people going to criticize me about? Mm-hmm. Like what is there to criticize? I've, I've given all this information away for free from the beginning. I've, I've been a sex addict. I've cheated on partners. I've been out of integrity in relationships. I've broken trust. I've, you know, had addiction with porn. If you Google my name, they're like, the words that come up are the things that people in public positions would probably hate to want to be known about them. Um, so I'm like, look, here it, here it is. You know, this is this is the ways that I'm still fucking up, you know. And the hope is it's like, hey, this is my genuine process of learning. This is genuinely what I'm still learning about myself. I hope this serves. If it doesn't, cool. But, you know, that's all I can do. Mm. There's a beautiful humbleness in this, in the willingness to be seen in like all of it. Because how many of us, and I know I've been this, just want to be seen in my good. Like, (laughs) just like, see me as perfect. See me as like love and light. I've got it all figured out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, It's like my ego loves that. But there's a really beautiful humbleness and a groundedness that comes when we're willing to admit the things that we aren't willing, like we don't want to be seen, the shame, yeah. the things that we want to tuck under the rug and ho- hope mum doesn't find because that's really what it is. It's just like, <laughs> hey, don't don't look there. I'm, I'm the perfect little boy. Or the kids from school, you yeah. know, like I did this process when I was really questioning why I was judging myself in showing up online and, and doing things and I had a coach lead me through this process. He's like, who, who are you actually wondering, you know, who's going to judge you? Who, who are you really afraid of? And where it actually came down to was somebody I went to high school with. It's two decades ago now. (laughs) It's not even a person who has any relevance in my life, but I still hold on to that, you know, to that little boy that doesn't want to be the kid that's out of place, which is a big part of what I experienced. You know, Mm -hmm. I I, I didn't belong. So, yeah, but belonging, having it figured out kind of connect for me is as a pattern that still shows up for Mm. sure. Mm, And it's so beautiful when we can see that little boy and realize they get to come with. Yeah, yeah. They get to come with. And like, this is a piece that I feel like you, you have a lot of knowledge about is the dark masculine, which I see very interconnected with our ability to own our own shame and our own shadow and actually sure. bring that through. And I'm wondering of your own experience in like how them two have interconnected for you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really cool question. So I guess for me, the dark masculine 
is a, an area of work that I've been focused on in the last couple of years. And I didn't invent the idea of dark masculine. It's been around and talked about in, in, in the area of, I suppose, archetypal energies. Um, and I yeah, had this amazing experience with, with someone I was in partnership with um, where my darkness was welcome. Mm. So we were intimate for the first time and it was fucking wild, like bite marks and scratch marks and animal noises and fucking just imagine a complete scene of mayhem after in the aftermath. And, yeah, it felt like for me that was something that in other circumstances I may have felt like, ooh, <laughs> shit, I want to go a bit too far. And what she said to me was, more. Mm. I want, I want more of that. And I just have so much gratitude for the experience of feeling welcome in my darkness and not just welcome but celebrated. And that began the journey for me to really reflect on my traditional understanding of masculinity with you know, the, the four primary archetypes, which I kind of now refer to as the light masculine. Mm-hmm. So the king, the magician, the warrior and the lover, mm-hmm. which – they have a, an element of them, for me anyway, that slightly connotates obedience or conformance to a set of rules or principles of a society. Because if you think about it, indigenous or ancient cultures would not have had dedicated standing armies to have the role, the position of a warrior, because every man would need to be able to embody that part of himself. You know, And the king, the idea of having a regent or a, or a head of... You know, a kingdom, again, sort of denotes this environment where we're existing inside of a civilization. You know, so the idea of those four, what I call, you know, light masculine archetypes just felt a little incomplete for me. Mm. Great foundation, great place to start, great model for masculine masculinity and understanding who you are as a man. But I was like, there's something missing. So I, I looked at this energy of, of what I identified in this first experience of making love to my partner was was we described as the beast you know mm. this primordial savagery but expressed in a really caring way while also wanting to fucking ravage and destroy her and i was like it doesn't fit anywhere <laughs> it doesn't fit in this model so what i realized is it sat between the lover and the warrior mm. there's a physicality there's a dominance there's a there's a visceral experience of power from the warrior and there's also the care it comes from the lover. And, you know, if you, look, if you think about the image of beauty and the beast, you know, beast is this fucking gnarly, powerful, you know, primordial being and bell, you know, standing under his protection, you know, this feminine, radiant, soft, vulnerable woman and the contrast between those two. That's the, the image I think of when I think of the beast. And that sort of began my journey to really look at, where are the other aspects of myself that I've shut down, mm. that I've shamed, that society has told me is wrong and bad, that are actually really deeply ingrained for me, that are there as instincts, as a man. And I started yeah, identifying what they were for me and, and, and ch- validating them with other men, saying, hey, does this exist for you? And, and I, I'd be, I started to see that there was this, yeah, there was this framework of other archetypes that, I could see were present, mm-hmm. you know, not just for me, but, but for men, what I consider almost universally. And yeah, it's been a focus of my work you know, ever since. Mm. That, that, like for me, I, I often see this path as a descent based path. Like when we're looking at the light, if we're looking at the light archetypes, as you speak of them, it's like very ascension based. We're looking to ascend to a different like level. And what you're talking about with the dark is descending into the earth, into the roots of this plane and this being. And, Like that for me often involves sexuality, our primalness, our animal. It's like all these components that are suppressed. And it sounds like they're the layers that you started to work through where there was shame and conditioning about it's not okay to be this as a man of like that primordial like animal that does want to fuck, ravage and destroy. It's like that's ingrained within us. Yeah. And how many men suppress that? I know I have. And it's something I'm still learning to be more in. And I think we all are. It's like, that's a big part, but it's been so shunned. Yeah. Conditioning is a big part for me. Like on the sharpen the spear, which is our three day initiation into the dark masculine. We talk about 
identifying and removing conditioning mm-hmm. and then discovering and embodying your true nature. And for me, the true nature means these instincts and desires that are present for all men, which have been there since the beginning of our evolution as this species, they are there whether we like it or not. They're going to exist. Mm. So you have a choice. You either suppress them or you embrace and channel them. And I definitely haven't got the balance right, you know, a lot of times. I've been the seducer, which is for me the dark side of the lover. And I've expressed that out of integrity, you know, been manipulative with women, you know, had sexuality driving my behaviours and desires in an unhealthy way. And it was going into that and reflecting on it and learning from it, realising, okay, that, that's, a, that's a valid part of me. Mm-hmm. That's a true part of me. And it's like, how do I now express that in integrity as best I can? Yeah. And, and that was the journey as you've been discovered more and more of that and like welcomed at home, it's been able to come into a greater place of integrity. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. there are definitely moments that I've misstepped. There's definitely moments when I haven't maintained that integrity. Um, you know, so it's not me claiming a space of having figured this all out and now standing on some station of fucking enlightenment about it. But I realised that I have become a lot more integral with the way that I express these than I have in the past. I'm more integral today than I have than I was before I started doing this work. I'm I'm more in touch with those desires. I'm more connected to what I want. I'm more accepting of who I am than I ever was. And yeah, all I can do is continue to discover and express these as best I can in my partnerships and in my life. Like it's not just about relationships either. Like it's, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, the dark masculine expression of the the warrior is the savage. You know, Mm -hmm. it's part of me that wants to fucking destroy and just the bloodlust of the rage of the primordial being that would just wants to destroy that, that that energy exists again for me. And I think probably for all men, if it's fair to say, how do I find places healthy, productive places for the, to put that that yeah. ca- that competition that that masculine you know conflict conflict you know and, and in a way that doesn't destroy in a way that doesn't hurt that the instinct and that desire is celebrated and brought through but in a way that doesn't ruin people's lives yeah yeah and I, I know for me when I've had that energy and I haven't allowed it to express I've wanted to burn down my business I've wanted to burn down relationships it's like I just want to destroy something even yeah. if it's beautiful even if I love it it's just like I want to fucking destroy and like this piece you're sharing about the dark masculine it's like for me I always find our wounding is what we're here to teach as well and it's this yeah. constant cycle of like cool this is where I've felt deficient Yep. And this is where I've met my own pains and this I will continue to initiate me so I can serve at a greater capacity. Yep. And that's yep. all it is. Yeah, the pain becomes the purpose Yeah, for sure. Yeah, looking back now, I realise I, I needed to be in environments where I didn't fit in. I needed to explore, you know, my own realms of darkness and addiction to discover that it wasn't a fruitful way to live. You know, and I have no judgment about anybody in different stages of of promiscuity or different relationship configurations, I hold no judgment. I just have learned that it has consequences. Um, And, yeah. And I think when we're in a leadership position, it actually allows us to have greater compassion for those people that we're here to serve as well. It's like I I see someone who's depressed and that's my background and it's like, oh, like I I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be self harm, and I know what it's like to want to kill myself. And it's like yeah. I can hold compassion for that, yeah. and know the pathway f- through that because I've been there. And it's such a beautiful thing to be like, cool. I see where you are. I welcome that. I'm not going to judge you because that doesn't help. And yeah. you can actually come through that, and that's beautiful. What was your pathway out of depression? Um, for me, it was like a lot of coaching, mentoring, eventually men's circles, um, quite a bit of psychedelics as well. But <laughs> that, I'm not going to lie, probably didn't serve um, for a little bit. Like it helped me open my world because I felt very stuck and suppressed in a system that I didn't align with and thought so crumbled that. But there was a period of feeling very lost and alone after that. Yeah. which led me to men's work and men's circles, which allowed me to ground back down from all the spiritual, higher ascension-based work. Yeah, I, I think 
my reflection on the ascent versus descent, I think there's a bit of tendency for people to throw shade on each side, you know, yeah. that, that I think it's it all has its place. Yeah. And and for me, the, cent, the center point, and I remember my teacher said this, something so, so simple to me. He said, he reached his hand up and he said, I'm, I'm connected to God. Put his hand down. He says, I'm, I'm grounded to the earth. And he put his hand to his left and he said, I'm, I'm free from the past. And he said, I'm unafraid of the future. And he said, and where that leaves me is here and now. Mm-hmm. As as a spiritual being having a human experience, uh, with a divine right of being for for who I am and where I am, and I do try to remember that you know, yeah. that, that there is absolutely a place for the for the medicine journeys and the spiritual enlightenment mm-hmm. and the ascension and the deep, you know ten day vipassana retreats and mm. and then also the deep shadow work of fucking crying your guts out and just looking at all the shitty things you, I've done to people and how I've fucked up and all the things I can own and be ashamed of but fuck me don't stay there yeah, no. <laughs> you know and I, I have so much compassion for folks that you know they just like I'm still deep in it right now I'm so in it you know it's like weeks go by or months go by I'm like yeah I'm really moving through some stuff right now and I'm really in this this portal of all this emotion and turmoil I was like cool at some point there needs to be a decision at some point there needs to be a choice and i'm talking to men here you know that there's a there's a future that's available to you when you make a choose when you make a choice to to step forward yeah yeah and and i think that that is a little bit of a trap and i know i was trapped in that of like i need to be constantly processing and looking for more and going deeper and deeper and yeah. Really, the underlying wound and the pattern for that was I wasn't good enough, so I had to fix myself to be loved. Yeah, it's the shadow of shadow work. <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> you're doing this so you can be loved, not to, as a way to love yourself. Yeah. And until you come to that place of like, ah, I'm actually okay and I do desire to work from me. And there's a paradox here because sometimes you actually do need to do the work to become okay. Uh, yeah, harmony, <laughs> balance in all things, yeah. for sure. I just, yeah, for me, the... I'm a very pragmatic dude about what I think is really helpful for a man in his life. And when a man comes to me and says, I'm depressed, I say, go help somebody. He said, what do you mean? I need help. I need help. It's like, no, go help someone else. And, you know, they say that like the definition of depression is like rumination, right? Mm-hmm. Reflection on your own thoughts. It's, that's the state that people enter in when they're, when, they're, when they're depressed. Thinking about your thinking won't solve the problem. And I, and I posted something about this the other day. I got some people triggered. It's like talking about your problems can only get you so far. Yeah. It, you know, it's the action that you take as, as a result of that. You know, and even if that's just to go for a walk, even if it's like go to the gym, even if it's just to eat cleaner, to have a conversation with a loved one, it's, it's call a bro, go to a circle. You know, whatever the action is, that's fantastic. But if there's no action and all, is, all that's done is talk, yeah, I think we're in mental masturbation. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes time. Like there is a point where it's like, if you've never talked to someone, for sure, that's your starting point. Absolutely. Start there, start there. But yeah. if you've been talking to the same story for a little while, <laughs> well, you're, you're stuck in a loop and it's tr- t- time to tra- do something different. It's like, yeah. Tell them the same story for a while now. I, yeah. I remember I used to sit in men's circles and I got, I get, I got a bit of shade for this recently. I, I posted the on socials about the distinction between a men's circle and a mastermind. And you know, I don't offer men's circles anymore. Mm-hmm because my experience was at times, I'm not saying everybody and I'm not saying every circle, but at times my experience of men's circles have been that, you know, you go to circle and then you come back three months later and the same guys are are telling the same story and there's no challenge, there's no action, there's no accountability. It's just thank you for sharing. And again, I think there's a place for that. To be heard is a great thing and there's an end in itself. But it's like, well, what happens next? Yeah, yeah. And and this, like, for me is where the, someone needs to be holding that pillar of, like, hey, let's call each other forward. And, like, maybe you only want to be talking for it. But if I'm in the circle and I'm, I've am i been talking about the same thing for a couple of weeks and I haven't done anything, I desire a man to call me on my shit because I'm in my shit. Yeah, and if you're not getting called on your shit, then it's not really men sitting in circle it's just a sharing space yeah you know, yeah I, I don't know this is my definition I, I sit in i sit in circle weekly and we have a rule that if you bring the same thing twice there, there better be some committed action that's being taken and and if you come f- 
for a third time with the same problem, you there's going to be a barbecue. Like it's it's yeah. it's on. Yeah. And and that's needed at <laughs> times. It's like, wow, I've been in this. Like, why have you not changed? Why have you not done something different? And it's like, well, I don't know. But maybe I do need that support. But the support looks loving in the fact I'm calling you forward into your own greatness, not in the loving I'm going to allow you to sit in your own bullshit again and again. And that doesn't mean to say there's not a compassionate space. Yeah. You know, I've gone through a separation recently and it's been – yeah, there's been some really – there's some times where I don't need a solution. I don't have an action. There's nothing to commit to. I'm just – it's just fucking hard. Yeah. You know, I had a beautiful relationship. Things happened that I probably won't go into here, but that there's a lot of love there still and there's a lot of and – the, and there was a lot of good there. And, you know, sitting in a space where men can just hear that and just say, yep, I got you and – what do you need? And and sometimes, yeah, it is just to be heard. And, you know, cycling through that, it's like the second and then the third week and then, okay, cool. All right, now I'm, there's some things I now can start doing, some yeah. things I need to – I would like to be held accountable on. Yeah. So I think, like all things, man, I think there's a balance. Yeah, yeah, it's the nuance of these conversations where we can say one thing and like a situation like grief, and I mean anything by grief, it's like grief cycles and yeah. circulates and there's many experience and – and just sitting in it doesn't mean we're bringing our problems, but just allowing ourselves to be in it is very different than being like, save me or fix me. It's just like, <laughs> I'm, I'm in this and this is okay to be in this. Yeah, that's that's part of what I think. I, I'm i more a warrior, kind of king, action orientation, I think personality generally. So yeah. being in that being side of the lover and being in the magician of the silence and the space is, that's my opportunity. <laughs> it's something I don't do as naturally. Um, so it's something I'm working on is actually allowing myself to be. Mm. And and this is it for a lot of us men where it's like, I'm really great over here and it's like, where are our weaknesses? And it's like, I don't want to go over there. I don't want to go over there, universe. No, don't make me go there. I mean, you want me to sit in my emotion? Fuck, okay, yes, I've got to sit in my grief. No, look, and it's been, yeah. it's been a great experience because, you know, if I'd been through this separation, well, fuck, I, you know, the last separation I went through, you know, I... I took a very, very different strategy to how I was processing that emotion. You know, I, in the past I would have jumped back on Tinder and lined up the next few dates and, you know, gone back into some old patterns of seeking comfort. And for me at the moment it's just it's the furthest thing from what I'm looking for and and it's just not what I'm doing, mm. you know. So for me right now it's allowing myself to be in the yeah. grief and, yeah, I think that whatever the, whatever the future holds, in terms of our friendship or possibility for the future, it's like I'm, I'm really clear that for me right now the place that I need to be is just within myself and just being. Mm. So, yeah, it's kind of something I'm working on at the moment. Yeah. It's, um, it's an edge. Yeah. yeah, Thank you for sharing that, man. I really appreciate you bringing that permission and like that vulnerability of realness here. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks for the space. Yeah, really good to see you. Thanks, brother. Good to be seen. Mm. Mm. Just want to take a moment. It's beautiful. <sighs> Man, I, I just, are you okay if we segue a little bit? For sure. Yeah. You, you mentioned like earlier on about the primal man and like how that got created. And I just want to segue back into that because I feel like the origin story is something I've heard and I've always loved like these pieces. It's like the vision come alive and then, you know, the time to create and the devotion to such a vision is always yeah. beautiful. So I really yeah. want to know what birthed the primal man for you. Oh, bro. It's a pretty cool story. So I went on a men's work event, uh, Blaze Grinner, coach in the sunny coast. I went on one of his bloke venture retreats and really cool, just, you know, a little Yui Boom box on the sand, you know, some sand with, with a towel and uh, we did a breath work. And by this stage I was I was pretty deep in the men's work scene at that stage for, you know, whatever it was, the two years, but, you know, I'd, I'd been doing it pretty intently and had already decided I wanted to become a coach. I could see that was there for me and, you know, I've been volunteering and so it was – the, the, the soil was pretty fertile and I went into this breath work and I had so this was like a holotropic style so big big breathe and I saw a man's face and it was sort of all sort of dark around the outside of his face all I could see was his face and he was his hair was long his beard was long you know he looked wild he looked like this man was was unkept you know, in, in a sense, but he was his skin was clean, and his eyes were bright blue. And his skin was weathered, uh, and I just 
don't know how I know, but you know, in a dream, these states you just know without knowing how you know. I just knew that he was an ancestor, and I knew he was a, an ancestor for modern Europeans, you know, Caucasian um, ancestor. And the look on his face was, it was forlorn. Like there was a deep sadness there. And he didn't say a word. He just looked at me and looked into me. And I realized he was disappointed in all of us. And um, I was like, fuck. Okay. That's pretty heavy. And once he sort of saw that I got the message, it was just this nod. And the nod was, what are you going to do about it? And yeah, you know, woke up from that vision, uh, breathe, and yeah, just the words that stayed with me were primal man. And what I what I received from that is that there is a way that we're living in the modern world that is a long way from the way we were designed to live, and I'm part of the problem. Living away from tribe, living away from nature, living away from the sacred, living away from essentially everything that we were in almost every way and yeah it felt like it was it was my marching orders and yeah registered the facebook and instagram page the next day you know as the sign of starting businesses these days it's like if you haven't got a facebook page is it really even a business bro um and it just yeah it it brought together for me so many things that i didn't even realize were there you know germinating under the surface the experience I've had in growing up in PNG, the the experience of going through initiatory practice with men's work and initiation, Mm. a a deep belief, like a deep fascination in evolution. I would always ask this question. I didn't know why at the time, but I would always ask people, what would the cavemen do? What would we be doing here? You know, and and my my ex-wife, she was like, why do you always talk about the cavemen? She's like, I'm fucking done with this caveman. (laughs) Whoever this caveman is, I want to meet him one day because the dude seems to run my life. We have to ask about the caveman all the time. But it just fascinated me how fucking completely ridiculously out of our alignment with our basic evolutionary principles, everything about our modern day life is. Our food, our shelter, our environment, the way we spend our time, how how we focus our energy, what we do in every single conceivable way is is the polar opposite to our basic principles of evolutionary biology of what we were likely to be needing to do. So, yeah, for me that kind of synthesized into something that was was quite coherent, you know. We were living a long way from our design and fuck, I mean, I, you know, jammed together a dodgy looking logo from fucking canvas stolen gifts off on the internet and then just yeah started the facebook page and started running men's circles pretty much you know pretty soon after that um and everything else from there has just evolved and mm. it's just it, it's become for me uh, an intersection like primal man project what it really represents is the intersection between our evolutionary biology what is what is the human man designed to be doing what is the current science around positive psychology you know how to get the best from our from our mind and what and and how we think with the current science around neuroscience what is the brain telling us the signals that we can read now with machines that didn't exist 20 years ago about the chemicals and the responses in the body like what is the definitive proof about this human machine and how it's responding to our environment and then the final piece which really brings it all together is ancient wisdom because in any of these modern day biohacking in any of these life optimizing strategies in any of these things you go back to the ancient texts you go back to the indigenous wisdom and there it is you know correlated five thousand years ago ten thousand years ago but you know that's oral tradition right we didn't have written but for me putting those pieces together gets into the center of how do we live as a, as a primal man, as a primordial being in this modern world? Mm. It changes how we operate within this world. Yeah. You know, we can't go back to living on the plains of Africa where we probably evolved. We can't go back to living in the caves of Europe where some of us were probably more recently evolved. But what we can, what we can reintroduce into society and into you know, our lives as men specifically 
are a couple of core principles. And the three pillars of my work in Primal are power, purpose and pack. And, and power for me is initiatory rites of passage that has a man discover who he is, discover what he's capable of, is put through a very difficult experience and then given an opportunity to hold himself to that and others hold him to a standard of power. And power meaning compassionate as well as driven, as well as assertive, as well as playful, peaceful, powerful, purposeful. You know, so that's for me, that's power. And the second for me is purpose. If you lived in tribes, you'd have a big tribe of people that you were here to contribute to. And there's a whole rabbit hole we can fucking go yeah. down in there about that. But that's the thing that I think a lot of men don't have, a lot mm. of men miss, is having something other than your family that you're contributing to. Mm. Well, even going back to your comment before about depression, if you're depressed, go help someone. Exactly. There's purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And and the final is pack. I mean, it, it's pretty self-explanatory, but for me it's 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 a group of people who, and for me it's men who inspire, challenge, support, and hold me accountable to who I say that I am. So those three pillars for me represent the summation of the work that I've done to mm. discover what the, essentially what the framework, uh, like a core framework for operation, you know, for a man, uh, for living a good life. And and for me, when you put those three things in a Venn diagram, for me, what sits in the middle is having an impact and creating abundance. Mm. Two very important pillars. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And impact for me just means the thing that I'm doing is of some use mm. and the abundance is abundance of time play joy resources wealth experience freedom yeah and the piece i love about this is the individuality of like what abundance and what impact can be for an individual man for sure like when i started this path i was like i need to make massive impact that affects the world and it's like do i even want that like some part of me is like actually that's not really important i just want to do my part and it's like figuring out what that is has been such a game changer which has allowed a land and in the body of like cool, this is my path, this is my purpose yeah. right now. You don't need to save the world to have an impact. Yeah, I, yeah. I definitely suffered from some of that, you know, delusions of grandeur and grandiosity <laughs> for sure. And I was, when I started, because in the, in the idea of purpose, I teach, um, I run a program called The Path and it yeah. really helps men find that, find their bearing, find their orientation to something that's big and worthy to do. Mm. And, we, you know, we, we help a man create his mission, his big, hairy, audacious goal, and then we break it down. But, you know, my big hag, BHAG was a million men meaningfully impacted by the Primal Man Project in the next 10 years. And I've, I'm th four years in, four and a half years in now, I've changed that number. I want 100,000 men impacted. And it's not shying away from the goal, but it's deciding what the kind of life is I want to live. Mm. So it's still making a significant impact. It's still creating things that have a global reach but it's doing it at a depth that I can still have connection with those people. Yeah. I can still speak from stage. I can still run events. I can still have an ability to be in an environment with people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think this also speaks to the willingness of what we're willing to sacrifice along yeah. the way as well. Like it's probably very likely you could do a million, but what yeah. would that cost you and your life that you exactly. want to live as well? Yeah. And like, are we going for balance? Are we being the transmission of what we want in the world or are we only going for the big number? Fame. Just fame and fortune, buddy. <laughs> fame and fortune. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> I love to be intimate with, with people and experiences, you know, yeah. and what I mean by that is like just like my three-day events, we have 12, 10, 12 participants and, and we have a similar number of crew. Like, you know, it's 22 men, you know. I, I want to be able to be – in a room where I don't need name tags, <laughs> and have be, and be able to sit at one table, yeah. you know that's that that kind of intimacy is really sexy for me. <laughs> yeah. And you know I might get a few years down the track and go, you know what, that hundred thousand just doesn't feel good anymore. It's more like ten, yeah. you know, and that's I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah, and this is a refinement, right? It's like yeah. it's it can be exciting to have the big audacious goal, okay. and then we start going towards it a couple of years later, and it's like oh. You know, I, like I love that goal. Maybe it will happen, but there's less attachment to that. But I know I'm on my path as well. Yeah, for me, it's the difference between commitment versus attached. Like yeah. I'm, I'm committed to the process. Yeah. I'm committed to the journey, um, but I'm not attached to what it needs to look like. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to go into this, like probably the, one of the last pieces here today of like, 
you, you spoke of like the birth and of the primal man and the vision you had that really allowed that to come in. And then you've been in it for four and a half years now. So I, I want to speak into the, like the devotion it takes to create a vision and bring that into the world and what that process has been like for yourself of holding that this time. Eating a big bag of dicks every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, like I love, I love what I do. Um, I, I heard this great quote from, I think it's Mark, Ma- I always fuck this up, Mason or Manson. The I subtle, know who you talk about. Subtle art of not giving a fuck. Yeah. And he talks about finding your purpose is like eating a shit sandwich. He's like, you know, one person might eat that, eat that shit sandwich and think it tastes nutty and delicious. And another person might eat that shit sandwich and think it's fucking foul. Find the shit sandwich that doesn't taste too bad. You know, for me, devotion to my purpose, which is to empower men to live life by their design, um, to have lives of impact and abundance. Like I, I'm clear about that as my North Star and I'm devoted to men as a... As a say as a baseline but like as a basic position i'm devoted to men living epic lives Mm -hmm. and anything i can do to to impact that is is what i'm here to do and it does help a lot in doing all the things that i have to do which i don't love to do you know this is fucking awesome if 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 the world could hear about what i (laughs) am doing through conversations like this i'd be fucking i'd be laughing but as we were chatting before, you know, like the social media and the ads and the advertising and the marketing and the sales. I mean, the business side of, of Primal, it's not something I thought I would have to create. I'm committed to it. Um, I love the outcome. But, yeah, definitely being deeply devoted to who I'm here to serve has helped me eat that shit sandwich. <laughs> The shit sandwich and, and like this is the truth i like you know we want to do something that feels good and feels exciting mm. and like i love this all the time and it's like you may be able to create that in your life and this is a conversation i have with people it's like you may be able to create that at some point but there's going to be things along the way that you don't want to do and you need to do them this wasn't in the fucking brochure <laughs> yeah. it's like for, for me coming into coaching and like wanting to help people, I was like, and now I got to go learn marketing and sales. Bro, it's 80% of the job. It, yeah. That was not in the fucking brochure. And <laughs> at my life coach training program, at my initiation, they said, if you want to be a coach, you got to eat a big bag of dicks full of marketing every fucking day. So just be aware, you'll be a professional marketer and a part-time coach. Yeah. And, and like, it's humbling to yeah. be like, I need to learn how I can do this in a way for me in alignment with myself that I enjoy. Maybe it's outsourcing, maybe it's doing it in a creative way where it's like, I want to do this because I want to see how this can impact people. I want the end results and being committed to that vision rather than this single moment while enjoying the moment. It's this fucking paradox, right? Yeah, man, when you get that figured out, you you, you let me know. (laughs) I'm continuing to learn and it's humbling me along the way of like... And I'm a big fan of like the artist's way. Uh, yeah. And I can't remember the name of the guy right now, but he writes about it. It's like when you find what you're here to bring this world, you're just showing up each and every day. We want the artist's life of the rock star. You know, it's big and wild. And it's like, no, it's devotion. It's each day you're showing up for me, the keyboard, writing my post, sharing, doing all of that. Yeah. That's a daily practice. Chopping wood, carrying water. And if only there was another way. Yeah. And look, I, I think I, I don't want to, like I'm fucking, you know, playing a little mini violin over here, like my, my poor life of my marketing. I'm so grateful. I'm yeah. so grateful to everybody who, every man who said yes to, to our work. And, and if I didn't, you know, flipping the script on that for myself and calling myself out on that, like if I didn't have those mediums of social media, if I didn't have the things that I use to, to communicate the ideas I have to men and, and call them in, you know, yeah. call them, call them into their their rites of passage and into their masculinity, into initiation, into really living incredible lives. If I didn't have those vehicles, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, you know, if I didn't have the years of sending DMs to strangers, you know, <laughs> that <laughs> I used to have a team of VAs in the Philippines that would reach out, you know, do do reach out to mutual friends, and it was just you know what my coach advised me to do at the time, and. I can look back now and I get those DMs and I'm like, bruh, what are you doing? So yeah, man, it's been a journey. Um, 
Chopping wood, carrying water. Yeah. And, and like any initiation, we've got to find things that we don't like and things we want to let go. It's like, you know, for me, then one of the next goals and the things I'm developing over the next couple of years is speaking on other people's stages and around mm. the country so I can actually meet people who are aligned with my work where I don't need to do as much social media. So also having visions where it's like knowing what we don't like as men and learning how to detach from that so we can be in more sovereign control of our lives as well. Or just sucking it up and getting it done because <laughs> we haven't done that enough <laughs> i'm talking to myself here i'm just i just need to suck it up stop complaining and get it done um mm. but yeah i i get it i mean can s- seeing the necessary work as part of a creative expression and a creative practice is something that i'm still learning to do yeah. it's not something that i've found a really neat groove with yet so yeah this is a great reflection i'll take uh, i'll take away this dean wisdom this podcast. Uh, thank you for giving that to me man th- this is more of the magician energy man this 100%. is what you're coming into and this is an energy <laughs> i love to play with i know i know let me sit in my tower top with my keyboard yeah. <laughs> when when i remember when we met at tigom and i was like yeah just energetically i think you and i sit at the opposite polarities yep. you know i think it's fair to say yep. um i love being around men who who, who have the polarity energies mm-hmm. to me because it's like what, what can i learn here yeah um, and it also triggers the fuck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great, yeah. And, and like for me, the, the trigger is like an activation of like, oh, fuck, I, I want a bit of that as well. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. for sure, for sure. Yeah. What, do I, what do I dislike in the experience or dislike in a person, not you, but just in a thing? You like, can dislike it in me. I'm okay to receive that. Oh, it's all right. It's, it's just as a generic statement, right? Like mm-hmm. what do I dislike in others? It's like that's the part I'm judging in myself, right? Yeah. It's such a cliche, but when I see – and I've, I've hung a bit of shit on – Dudes that I see when I go to some of these men's work events and it's beads and it's hippie, long hair, the dreads, and I'm like, you know, like, yeah, I'm just going with the flow and it's really just tuning in and really just feeling into my yoni and like and and uh, it's it, it's actually me judging that part of myself. Yeah. It's me judging the flow, it's judging the easefulness, it's it's me wanting it to be hard because I think it needs to be. Yeah. Um it's the it's the fucking warrior that flagellates you know this is me thinking about myself now i'm like i'm flagellating myself it's like it must be painful it must be hard i must must make it harder uh flows for (laughs) flows for foofy dudes i don't need i don't need flow yeah i must make this a struggle (laughs) and and that's the piece it's like as we integrate more parts of ourselves it we can have greater access to different states of being and maybe it's flow maybe it's ease and it's like that's my learning at the moment like, I'm like, can I experience grace in my business? And I'm like, oh, I don't know about that word. That, like, And I'm looking at your face and you're like, <laughs> fuck this guy. And I'm like, it, it, grace, okay. Like, but that idea of like their flow, ease, yeah. like uh, ability to just be in it, be present and not have to struggle. It's like, can I go beyond that or like be in the struggle so deeply that I'm not fighting it? Yeah, I guess we're probably coming at the same thing. Mm maybe achieving a similar outcome but considering it differently yeah my experience of the struggle is i kind of have this machiavellian like laughter to myself of my own pain (laughs) i'm a masochist i think i'm like give me the pain i just like it and i'm gonna fucking do it i'm gonna keep going i'm not stopping the outcome is the same yeah Uh, but the experience of it for me is it's like a necessary evil rather than looking for the joy in it Mm -hmm. um so, yeah, maybe. And look, there's a part of me that wants to like argue with you about it because I'm like, nah, it sounds pretty feminine, bro. Uh, you know, like there's there's a part of me that's like judging that. Mm-hmm. But I also realize that's the wisdom that's that's missing for me. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's that flow piece that's missing. Mm-hmm. And and I can see like for in myself, it's like cool. I like I can have the aversion to the like I just need to get it done. There's been periods where I'm like, no, nah, I just like how can I make this get into a state where I know this will flow through me because I I can spend eight hours on a landing page or I can do it in one hour. Oh yeah, and that will depend on the state I'm in and being aware of like how I work within myself and bringing that awareness of like what do I need to make this more easeful. Yeah, a- and knowing that and that may mean going through some shit to get to that state as well. <laughs> For sure, I, th- I think there's there's a place for both. Yeah. You know, there's a place for getting into a, a state. There's sometimes a place for just sitting at that desk until it's fucking done. Yeah, and that's why we have the warrior and the magician. Yeah, 
<laughs> That's why we're both here today. <laughs> we're integrating one another yeah. and being like, okay, how can I be more like Jason? How can I be more like Dean? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I said, man, receiving a lot. Yeah. And it's definitely, I can, I don't know, what, what's your listenership? Are they mainly men or, or women? Pr- pretty 50 50. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think about what, what, what the ladies and the guys out there be thinking. Um, probably not worth speculating. Mm. Yeah, but I think we're going down that route. Like, is there anything still alive that you want to, like, really share or feel like it wants to be here today? Mm, cool. Um, <sighs> no, I just um, just want to express gratitude, man. It's been it's been wild. I feel like it's I feel like it's only just getting warmed up now. That it's also <laughs> part of my like, I want to stick, I want to stick around. I'm only we're only just for now, but it's no, it's been good, man. I, mm. I yeah, no, there's nothing really here for me um, in my work or in or in focused on right now that, that hasn't been shared um i guess i'm happy to you know share a little bit more about how might how people might be able to reach out if yeah. that's okay with you yeah that's beautiful man please do yeah cool so if you want to find out more about my work primal man project on facebook and instagram it's the best place to have a look and we've got a youtube channel as well but if um if men are interested in getting in touch and i obviously work exclusively with men um you know you can reach out via the facebook page and send us a dm and let us know you want to have a jam and oh, I'm so happy to have conversations with people. Yeah. It's, it's, I love it. So if there's curiosity there, if this um, strikes something, then um, yeah, reach out. We can, we can have a chat. Yeah. Cool. Cool. If you're looking for Jason's info, all his links will be in the show notes so you can easily find that, reach out to him. He's a man really enjoyed having on today, man. It's been an absolute pleasure. And like you said, much gratitude to you and what you're bringing to the table and pleasure to sit here with you. Yeah. Thank you, bro. Appreciate you. Thank you all for joining us on The Weird Way. That's us. Peace.